Welcome to this rewind episode of 50% Facts. Back to the past. Back to yeah, flashing back to the past. Um, yeah, I'm uh, I'm gone for a while and um, uh, like a month, and uh, it just we have been pretty busy around here, and it has been too difficult to um, really load up on episodes, um, main episodes. So we went back to some older ones. Yeah, for those that are newish or haven't been around for I guess three years now or so, um, or whatever it is, um, our old show used to have a little bit different format. So what we would do is we'd grab a question from um, the world, from our experiences, from right. anywhere, um, and we would match an expert or find an expert in that category. Jim and I would rant about it and kind of give our joking but not joking opinion before because some of the answers we knew-ish or had experience with right. um, and some we were clueless. And then we would call in our expert and they would give you the flat-out truth about it all. So mostly nutrition, health, fitness, kind of like uh, we always do, mental health, etc. cetera. Um, and so a lot of these episodes you're going to hear in the upcoming weeks, not a lot, but a few of these episodes you're hearing in the upcoming weeks are a flashback to some of that. Um, and many of the topics are still very, very um, relevant. Yeah, so f- uh, first off... Um uh, is an episode with Dr. Mike Israetel about whether meal timing makes any difference or not. And uh, I think that the, this information has maybe fluctuated a little bit since this this episode came out in August of 2019. It's fluctuated a little bit, but I think that the basic truth is still there um, relative to, to meal timing. It's something that... Um, was very popular for a while and very people were very um, uh, strict about their timing and then there was a wave of it doesn't matter and then there, now there's kind of a wave of um, maybe it matters a little bit. I don't think the science has actually changed at all. I just think it's people's interpretation of it. Um, and obviously, yeah, this is just my opinion, but I think a uh, majority of stuff has stayed the same it's just what people want to pretend to make content around because yeah, content for content sure. creators and fitness have turned into content creators rather than coaches who put their info online yeah. so they're constantly trying to regurgitate or reformulate what the fuck's going on and then the other factor is um, people majoring in the minors and just choosing what area they're trying to minor in today because um, overall it won't really matter it'll be one percent of gains if you time your protein uh dose it out through the 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 day um but the chances of that mattering for even an ifbb pro is so little yep so anyway you can enjoy our conversation with uh, mike israel israel tell after this he is uh you know if he wasn't so smart he'd still be funny and so uh he's he's generally hilarious and we enjoy talking to him we'll have him like we want to have him like around at some point like actually here yeah. or i didn't run into him i ran into nick they're both owners of uh renaissance periodization but uh, i didn't run into mike at the arnold i saw him but i didn't get yeah. to I didn't talk to him i don't think he would recognize me yeah he was <laughs> just probably busy. the street but he's probably uh, busy busy he, well they, uh, their booth was very busy at the arnold all right so enjoy this episode and we'll see you back on uh, on friday with a topic thunder and next week with another rewind hey, this is going to date this episode but i'd like to point out that um that my Giants are now number two in the National League West. <clears throat> they went on a run. They've won like 16 of the last 20, something like that. I don't watch any baseball, but we'll play uh, Call of Duty or stream with uh, Marcus sometimes, our boy Philip uh-huh. Thunder, and he'll have the game on the background. So you hear him like screaming at people <laughs> on the game while we're trying to. He's a big Giants fan. Yeah. But uh, the crazy thing about that is that they're in they're in second place, but they're fourteen and a half games back Yikes. from the Dodgers, who are in first place, which just tells you that sometimes in life you can be number two, but number two is so far yeah. down the scale. That's a lot of things. I I, people don't want to hear that. Yeah, but people don't want to hear that. Well, that's just don't, the truth. But it is true. Yeah. you can you know you can be uh, relatively successful from that position too, though. For sure. You know. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You just got to come to grip and like. I don't know how healthy it is or not, but I just like to try to just stay in my own bubble more. 
like, hey, my things are doing good. Instead of comparing my things to Omar Esau's things thing. or Barquan's things. And obviously that's easier said than done with social media. I'm, I am looking at other people's shit and I get down. Like, well, they're, your, they're your friends too. So yeah, you yeah, hear yeah, what's yeah. going on yeah, with them. And yeah, stuff. yeah. And, and other, you know, network and the fitness industry or whatever. I'm like, damn, they're doing this and I'm not doing that. But like to find like happiness, I just find my routine and then any kind of growth is good enough for me. But people don't want that either. People, I want to be the best or I'm not going to do it at all or shut the fuck up. I think so, sometimes too with that kind of growth, you can't tell... Um, but you're actually, you're getting deeper, but not getting, not getting broader. So your, your audience might be, might look the same, but you're For getting sure. deeper because you're, you know, you're providing more information. For you, sure. You're showing more of yourself. You've been at it for longer. And, um, yeah, that's everything I want to do is culture and community. You know, that's what we try to build here and on my Twitch and on my YouTube and Instagram or whatever. Me and Connor were talking about this the other day. He had a college friend that, uh, blew up like 50 million views on a bunch of YouTube stuff yeah. doing pranks. Um, tons of videos, 4 million subscribers, all this stuff. Numbers I can't even fathom, you know, a hundred times what my YouTube's channel's done. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, that's very cool. I was like, one, I don't know if this kid loves doing pranks. Two, you know, sure, he's adding entertainment to people's lives, but like three, like do people feel connected to him? And that's like my goal is to like share my story, my path, my knowledge with people so that they feel connected when they're in like a lost place so they can either smile, they can learn, or they can progress mm -hmm. connecting to me and my story. They're just doing pranks all the time. And then even on a business standpoint, like what are you buying from a pranks guy? Like there's no connection. There's no depth. Right. Right. It's just broader and broader and broader. Chinese finger traps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Whoopie fucking cushions. Whoopie cushions. Yeah. Like you're, you're not doing spray. anything where like, um, people believe in my knowledge, they believe in my path, and so I can help people along the way in multiple things from my business and even just the content. And that's obviously what our goal here, too, is to build a community that, you know, wants to find the truth on anything. You know, mm -hmm. we, we were talking about doing a whiskey and beer um, episode coming up. We did olive oil with my mom. Right. We, we want to do more business things here. We've done some psych stuff, some sports psych, obviously the science of nutrition and lifting, uh, even just cultural stuff. The, you know, the episodes with Omar and Eric Helms were really, really good. We're talking about kind of the cultures of bodybuilding mm -hmm. and things of that nature and on their podcast. So building, building the community and feeling good about what I do uh, and maybe the Giants feel great, and they don't care if they're in 14th. They feel they, pretty good. Yeah, yeah. They, you can still make a run in the playoffs. There's always like other steps and things. Sports mm. are a little different than life, sadly. Like people don't want to admit that either. But like sports, sometimes people are just gonna be better than you. Mm -hmm. Sports sometimes, uh, and this is sometimes in life. Uh, sports are direct. You're directly going against someone else, whether you want to say it or not. You're directly going against somebody else's direct competition. Mm -hmm. Especially at the major leagues, where it's a money money game. Um, <clears throat> and then two. You just can't outwork uh, genetics uh, at the highest level. No. Um, if, 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 even the medium level, even the beginner level. You know, I got by probably first through fifth grade in basketball just being faster than everybody. And then from there, I had to get better at the game. And then, you know, you do, you, you need to work to be the best. But I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is, like, genetics do rule all. We've seen it in powerlifting. We see it in weightlifting. Why can some kids just squat 600, like, mm -hmm. with a year of training? And other kids never squat 600. Mm -hmm. Same body weight. Some guys can even look jacked. And not squat 600 pounds. It's just how it goes. It's genetics. Yeah, and it comes down to making the most of what you have and not trying to um, try to shoot something that you're just that is never going to happen, and you're just going to disappoint yourself. For sure. You know? um, I'm I'm one of those people that I'm that is very skeptical of super crazy stretch goals that people throw out there, or even having them for myself. Yeah, and yeah. I, and I'm bothered when people who haven't accomplished anything in a long time it, it will come out and public uh, publicly in social media and say they're going to do yeah. x thing that seems really improbable yeah. i don't know why social media does that a whole new thing and i don't know where what's right wrong or what's for you but like just announcing your goals to the public's a little different like i i told people like hey i want to clean and jerk something decent and like follow my path but that's different like i'm going to the olympics follow yeah me. or it's <laughs> going to be x weight you know? yeah yeah uh, you yeah know? i don't know and even if it is like it's I guess it's the intent behind it makes the difference. Like, is it intent to make shock value and make people follow you? Or is it intent just saying, this is my goal. I'm now making a public to hold myself accountable and you follow me. And so like the intent matters a lot. Yeah. Except that the studies seem to show that the accountability doesn't work that way. No, no, it's all internal no and, matter what. And, and that there's some people get so much of a discharge off of s publicly stating a goal that they lose yeah. their momentum for yeah, and just actually for, trying to attain it. Forget it and whatever else. Yeah, yeah it's, it makes it easier to discharge. Yeah, which I'm, is popular with diets. People saying they're cutting, they're bulking, they're doing this or that or whatever, especially, again, with social media. It becomes so easy to walk that line of telling your story and telling your journey and yeah, trying to find motivation or accountability through it. Yeah, so 
in terms of making the most of of what you got, we're talking about um, nutrient timing. If yeah. you're eating the same amount of food every day, does it matter when you eat it? Yeah. No matter what the composition is when you do eat it. Yeah, because there's a lot of history of you know not eating past 7 p.m. Uh, all these time restrictions, eating an hour before you train, eating an hour after you train, um, higher fat in the morning or higher fat, no carbs at night. There's all these different rules. Car- carving up before uh, some kind of athletic performance. People Carving up yeah. the day before. Yeah, people go pounds of pasta before a marathon. Yeah, that seems like, yeah, I don't know. I'd shit myself. I, I, yeah, me too. But yeah, uh, so we have Dr. Mike Ischertel, and he's going to answer some of that. You know, I think they're, to me, um, in my experience working with people and personal experience, one, you got to figure out, like, what works for you mentally and physically. And I think it even counts for podcasts. Like, people say, like, oh, you're just talking to a microphone. Well, like, yeah, go ahead and try it, dude. I dare you. But secondly, uh, like, I prep for these things. I make sure I eat at the right time. I make sure mm-hmm. I, like, dose my coffee at the right time. <laughs> I make sure I'm listening to good music to put me in a good mood. Uh, I do d- sometimes... Uh, do like stupid mouth drills. I make sure that I'm ready to talk. I yeah. make sure that my brain's working the same with my mouth. Um, and I'm prepared. I take a shower before each one. Uh, e- even if I've <clears throat> already showered in the morning, I'll shower again before this. It's just my mental prep. I have these things to prepare for this situation that set me up for success. And I think um, nutrient timing, uh, timing your carbs, meals, water, all those things uh, can somewhat be individual. Uh, you know, I've some, known some people that can slam a burrito an hour before training and then smash weights. For me personally, I need two or three hours. I think the athletic endeavor obviously matters. Um, and so I think Mike, Dr. Mike will obviously agree with that. But I want to know kind of the science of what's optimal. Because I do think, blanket statement, that if you're hitting your macronutrients – Shout out to Eric Helms and kind of his pyramid of what's important in, in nutrients and, mm-hmm. and training even, and, and but definitely nutrition. Um, there's this huge basis, and you're going to get 90 to 95% of your success just hitting your macronutrients every day. Get enough protein, carbs, and fat daily consistently for your goal will lead the most gains. Um, and then the top 5% are broken up to a couple different things. You know, it is probably nutrient timing, getting the carbs into the right time optimally for recovery and for performance, supplements, quality of food mm-hmm. beyond that um you know we did another episode on soy soy protein versus you know maybe a whey protein or something that's a little bit more complete those little things will add up in the top five percent um i want to know if mike or, or, or science says that nutrient timings may be more important than that but everything i've come across and i've worked with um it's it's a lot more minuscule for the majority of people if you're heading towards the olympics mm-hmm. you're playing in the nba Maybe you need to take a look at them to get every single edge out of it. And I, I suppose that we can also talk a little bit about like what used to be the common bodybuilder meal plan, where you ate six times a day, yeah. whatever, and for you know small meals six times a day, whatever. In terms of how that affects um, both your recovery, your gains, or whatever, and then also um, uh, your metabolism, which, which, yeah. which is a, another episode. But still, because training and training and um, uh, nutrition. Everything kind of, and even science, everything kind of, not science necessarily, but training, nutrition, common beliefs go in a, a seesaw pattern where, like, maybe the 90s, they got all complex. Mm-hmm. You got to have eight grams of BCAAs every half hour and all these things. And then, and then, and then it, it turns too much the other way where they simplify it too much. Yeah. Um, where they say six meals doesn't matter. But I'm pretty damn sure there's a study that shows if you equally dose your protein in f- uh, four to six meals opposed to two to three meals, you do have more protein synthesis, more recovery, more muscle gain in, in, in the, in the, in the higher meals spread out um, and that's just because of how our metabolism works you can only absorb and, uh, and synthesize so much protein at a time so if you have one meal shout out to these intermittent fasters <laughs> if you only have one meal of 200 grams of protein for me uh, or I have six meals of that 200 grams of protein um, broken up in, in four or five six meals mm-hmm. it will be more optimally utilized in more meals and that is just science so how much will that affect how, how I look how I recover maybe not noticeable for the everyday person but in the long term if you do that every single day for the next 10 years and i'm trying to go to the nba or i'm trying to be a pro bodybuilder mm-hmm. or i'm trying to go to the olympics now it may play a significant role it, it adds up it, and just for, from an experience standpoint too sometimes after a big workout like i'm ravenously hungry yeah. depending, regardless of when i ate sometimes i'm really not yeah same some, some, like i really just don't not not entertaining the idea of eating and like are you giving up something by not jumping in your eating. window? Yeah. I think there window. is a window. Uh, I know it's come from get that protein in after your last set to maybe the next two hours, and we'll yeah. see what uh, Dr. Mike has on the on the latest data. All right. 
Now, I think this is one of your favorite topics. I don't know. I've followed you for a long time. I've learned a ton from you. We've hung out in L.A., shot some videos, things like that. But uh, this is something that I think gets um, kind of skewed both ways. Um, and we want to dive in and just kind of get your general thoughts. Maybe we'll get a little more specific. But we want to talk about nutrient timing, um, maybe just for the general public, uh, health reasons, um, aesthetic reasons, and performance reasons. Um, and then maybe we can talk about even meal timing if you want to tie that in as well, the old school thought of eating six meals a day, stoke my furnace or whatever you're doing. Uh, and then also, yeah, like timing your carbs, timing your fat, timing your protein. How much does that matter um, in the grand scheme of things? Well, I've had my furnace stoked a number of times. It was <laughs> nothing to do with food at all. No carbs were involved. I mean, technically there were carbs, but... Chocolate syrup. Uh, uh. Is lube carb? <laughs> anyway. How many, car uh. how, many car how many carbs are in KY? <laughs> Dude, I'm sure somebody's asked that question before. I promise you. That'll be our next episode. Yeah, how many carbs <laughs> in edible panties? <laughs> like that. You're not supposed to swallow the KY. Good God. Um, so uh, meal, frequency, nutrient, having all that good stuff. So yeah. two things to sort of start out the discussion. Thing one, for people that are interested in performance and body composition at a relatively high level – Nutrient timing probably accounts for something like 10% of the differences in effects between different diets. So mm. if you do intermittent fasting versus if you eat like properly timed five to six meals a day, you might have up to a 10% difference in diet result, uh, which is like, you know, it's not going to be the difference between making you an elite athlete and not an elite athlete. But like if you are gunning for the Olympics and you decide to do intermittent fasting, you might take like second or third where you would have won. I don't think anyone really wants that. So if you're like, uh, if you're competitive in sport, I would, I would say that nutrient timing is definitely something for you to look at. Um, if you're recreational in sport and you generally are cool, like you really like the lifestyle thing or eating multiple meals does not appeal to you, you're really just not missing out on much. So if someone tells you some shit like you're not going to gain any muscle or you're not going to get leaner if you don't eat a bunch of times a day, they're fucking full of shit. But if they tell you like you're not going to optimize your performance to within several percent of your capability, I don't know who the fuck can come no up No one's to, ever like, said that. Nerdy shit like that. Yeah. You're like, I'm sorry, do I know you? Like, <laughs> just sitting next to you on the bus. When you were saying that, can you repeat that nonsense one more time? <laughs> right. Like you know but they would technically be correct right so <laughs> so that is that's it for body comp performance on the health side they've studied a bunch of diets so far and from what we can tell and the research on this is not super expansive but there's also some animal studies and cell studies to confirm this it probably matters almost not at all if you eat nine times a day once a day or every other day it's and, and for pretty much everything in between so for health uh, and longevity, it probably doesn't fucking make any difference whatsoever how often you space your meals or any of that shit. But, but for performance, it does have some of the deal. Uh, and, and sometimes it is worth saying, some people are sort of conflicted about which one they're into. Like, I meet a lot of guys in jiu-jitsu. They're like, I fucking do intermittent fasting. I'm like, sweet, you watch Joe Rogan. And they're like, fuck, yeah, I do. And I'm like, sweet, so do I. And they're like, yeah, it's the shit. Like, it's the only thing that works. And I'm like, mm, Joe's never said that. And also, that's false. And then I'm like, dude. They're like, so they find out I have like a PhD and all the bullshit. And they're like, so what do you think I should be doing? Which is really another way of asking like, yeah, please approve of my intermittent fasting. <laughs> right. And, and, uh, I'm usually like, well, you know, do you compete in jujitsu? And they're like, if they say yes, I'm like, you know, intermittent fasting is probably not the greatest idea in the world. Like you put in your fucking, your, your record on there, right? Like you want to win. You should probably eat at least three meals a day, probably more like four or five. And I can get into with you guys why that is. But like, if you're like fucking like a jujitsu dad who just is doing it for three hours, every couple of weeks to get the fuck away from his family which he hates and the life which is crumbling around right just outside of him then fuck it intermittent fast away who gives a shit uh so then what does it look like if we were to optimize performance let's say for uh, a weightlifter powerlifter jujitsu guy maybe even a basketball player um how and why would we spread out to optimize these uh sports that's a great question. I was actually on a, on a, on a development team for the National Basketball Association. Did you guys know that? Do, uh, did they give you a jersey? Were you on the team? I was, like, technically on the team, yeah. but, like, not, I you get know. It. I get it. That's my whole life. <laughs> that was too, yeah, I was too tall, they said. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, too jack. Too good. I don't even know what that means, but, you know, I, <laughs> I can take a hint. I walked off. Okay, Mr. Um, Kobe. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's what they called me. That was my nickname. <laughs> it's weird. How do you know that? So... <laughs> 
So anyway, uh, there's just a couple of concerns you have for athletes. One, there's the sort of pre-workout meal, which can be like one to four or five hours before training, depends on how big it is and depends on like how you handle food during training. Um, and that like stops off your glycogen stores, gives you good blood glucose, basically feeds your brain so you have energy and you can like psychological energy to perform. You know, like if you haven't, people say like, I love intermittent fasting and they're like, how do you feel after 16 hours of not eating? Like fucking energized. I'm like, Shut the fuck up. Like really? <laughs> Like, if I was like, all right, you're fucking, you wake up on a fucking island and they're like, you know, like these rich fucking cocksuckers are like hunting you, like, well, you know, hunting man. And like, you have like an hour to get through this course and we're going to be shooting at you. They're like, do you want a snack or not? You're like, no, I'm good. I work better fast. And like, you're not going to say that shit. You're going to be like, yeah, give me a fucking bagel so I can run the fuck up out of this island. Or, or is the bagel poison that's going to slow you down? Who knows, right? Do you even trust these people? I trust Why no one. you take a bagel for them? I, exactly. Which will probably never get you into the scenario, but I trust everyone, so I've been in the scenario <laughs> several times. Um, so, like, it's one of these things where, you know, eating sometime before training probably enhances your energy production. It's probably good for performance. And, and on the other hand, eating within, you know, an hour after training generally is, is a better time to refuel yourself from training it cuts down the catabolic processes of training and muscle burning processes and lets you start the recovery process early. So like if you had like an eight hour window after you trained before you went to sleep and somebody asked like technically when is the best time to eat if you're going to just eat once, it's probably as close to the training right after mm. as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, so those, those are the two concerns that sort of immediately spring up our two most important meals, the pre-training and the post-training meal. And then like also your body doesn't generally tend to want to build muscle if you don't expose it to uh, muscle growth, uh, promoting nutrients, sort of not all the time, but most of the time. And a lot of that's protein. So like every like, oh, four to six, maybe four to seven hours, your body wants another meal that uh, has a lot of high quality protein in it. So you're probably going to spend a sandwich in a couple more of those meals in the day. And one of them is going to occur like closer to bedtime. So you have some amino acids in your blood while you sleep, which means you're going to grow a little better, probably recover a little better. So on the net balance, that is like, if, if you're an athlete and you train once a day, you can probably eat as few as three meals a day and get most of those things checked off, but you're probably better off eating like more, maybe like four or five meals. And that'll be probably the close to optimal and anything between like four and seven meals is probably a wash between all those is how effective, but then it gets a little more complicated if you eat, uh, if you train multiple times a day and you're a very serious athlete, especially if you train very long durations, like several hours, intra workout shakes become meaningfully different then. That's probably a good idea to have some of those. And uh, nutrient timing is really important. Like if you train twice a day, if you get in carbs as soon as you're done training in the first time, you have more glycogen and more energy for that second workout versus if you wait a, even 30 minutes or an hour, it could notably affect your workout poorly if you wait. So then nutrient time becomes more specific and probably more like four to six, four to seven meals becomes closer to optimal. Uh, what about the protein distribution? You mentioned uh, kind of triggering some protein synthesis throughout the day would be good, three to four. Um, you know, there's talk of how much protein you should have at each meal. I assume if you're having three to four, you would just want to kind of break up your protein evenly? Yeah, that's exactly the right assumption. Yeah, so generally speaking, you just want to break up your protein into roughly even increments. Uh, and how do you get the increments? Is like, well, you know, your number of meals and your total daily protein. If you're taking like a gram per pound a day, which is reasonable, then you just divide that shit by like three, four, five, or six or whatever, and you get your protein amount. So is there some difference there, like some variation? Totally. Like, can you have like a 30 gram whey protein shake and then later have like a 70 gram uh, protein steak? Totally. But just don't do anything. So anything crazy, like have five grams of protein in one meal and 90 grams in the other. Mm. Like, there's nothing wrong with the 90 grams, except most of it's going to be burned for energy because your body can only anabolize, turn into muscle enough, some protein at some time. So it's not that the 90 is too much. Your body can't process it. Like you can process it. It's just going to burn it, most of it off for energy. You'd be better off taking, you know, cap like at least 30 grams off that 90, stuff it into 35 instead of five. And now you have two anabolic meals versus just one meal that's anabolic and one meal that's not. So let's take a, an average person who is trying to lose 20 pounds or something like that. Does their their meal timing or, or just how frequently they eat make any difference at all if calorie equated? Are they training with weights or no? No. Uh, no, it makes pretty much no difference at all. Yeah. yeah. So if you eat one meal a day and you eat the same calories five meals a day, no. Uh, one thing that nutrient timing almost certainly has no effect on is your uh, metabolic rate. Um, there is a little bit of nuance with non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Mm. If you are one of these people that responds really well to intermittent fasting, then when you're not stuffed full of food, you have lots of energy and you move around the day, no problem. And maybe something like coffee helps with that. Um, and then it does, that's not an issue, but some people, if they don't 
eat consistently, their activity levels drop off because they get so tired. Do you guys have any friends or family that like if they don't eat every three or four hours, they just stop. They're like, I need to eat or I won't be able to get any work done. I won't be able to move around. Like, yeah, that's the hangry thing. people. So if you're one of yeah, exactly. Yeah. So if you're one of those people, you can actually get slightly worse results in a weight loss plan if it's not enough meals because your expenditure of energy will turn down because you don't have enough energy to move around. But generally speaking, within a very wide range of meals for most people, it doesn't fucking matter. You eat two meals a day or six meals a day, you're going to lose the same amount of weight. Now, how much of that will be muscle versus fat? If you're not training, there's going to be fucking no difference pretty much. If you're training, then you're going to retain significantly more muscle eating many meals per day or more than three versus eating less than three. It's not a ton, but it's significant, meaning that we can detect it in studies. So if you want to diet for a bodybuilding show, you're not going to do it intermittent fasting. You can. You're just going to lose way more muscle than you need to. Uh, I know you mentioned protein out evenly uh, throughout the meals, and it might depend on sport or the athlete and obviously the goals. But what does some of the carb distribution say for someone that's doing four meals a day and their trainings in the middle of the day look like? Just generally. Yeah, totally. So, like, yeah. So, you know, you can – there's a lot of ways to slice it, but probably a more optimal way – would be like, you know, have a little bit more than, so let, let's say you have like just your carbs split up evenly among all four meals to start with. You might like take instead of 25, so it's 25% of each meal, right? And instead of 25% for your pre-workout meal, you might go to like 30%. And instead for your post-workout meal of 25, you might go to like 40%. Hmm. And that means you only have 15% of the AM meal, 15 in the PM. Like that's a good way to do it. What you don't want to do is like overvalue nutrient timing because it's not that powerful and be like, all right. of my pre-workout, 50% of my post, zero fucking carbs in my AM and PM. And someone's like, hey, do you want peanut butter in your shake in the morning? Or a fucking peanut butter is three grams of carbs per scoop. Are you out of your fucking mind? I'll get out of ketosis and I'll die. Like, (laughs) that shit's definitely not true. So just bias it a little bit, kind of like, you know, just a little bit more carbs pre and post, and and then you've probably covered all your bases. Oh, wait, shameless plug. Can I make a shameless plug? Hit away. Absolutely. The fucking RP Diet app which your boy over here fucking created all the basic algorithms for, uh, actually does all this fucking shit for you. You don't have to think about a goddamn thing. You just type in your goals, type in your favorite foods, and shit tells you, it reminds you when to eat each meal. You get to pick your favorite foods, and it tells you how many of the combinations, how much to put on your plate, and you get all your fucking results. And then you're happy when you're leaner and you have a billion friends, and all of a sudden even the sky looks pretty Dog's walking itself. Yeah, again, dog walks itself. The dog respects you like it goddamn well should. Your images just appear on Instagram without actually any effort on your part. You don't have to post or write a caption. Yeah, Dude, you like, I I actually finished a diet recently and I walked by and there was like this brick wall in Philly and they had me, you guys remember like the hope and change Obama thing? Yeah. Like that photo. They had me like that on the wall. You and Meek Mill. That's it. Yeah. (laughs) Him and I were together and and we were holding hands and I was like, I don't even know who the fuck Meek Mill is, but I'm down with it. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, What about last but not least fat? Uh, How would we distribute fat? Um, throughout those four meals roughly uh so generally speaking if you eat lots of fats they reduce the rate at which carbohydrates are absorbed and Mm. proteins are absorbed um so if you eat a lot of fat in your pre-workout meal two things one your carbs don't get into your blood nearly as uh, quick as you want so you might be in a situation where you need carbs in the blood but they're still in the gi tract and two if you eat enough fat fat is um it's not in, a, in any sense more difficult to digest. It just takes longer. It's more laborious of a digestion process for the GI tract. So um, if you have too much fat in your GI tract, then you're more likely to just ex- exhibit like gastric uh, distress mm. when you're exercising really hard. Like, for example, you know, you don't show up to Chipotle like 30 minutes before a hard squat workout. And you're like double guac, double cheese, double fucking sour cream and double that sour cream again <laughs> and then twice. Like, sir, the entire burrito sour cream, you're like, that's what I fucking want. And you got to fucking hear me. <laughs> the so sight of lard. That, right, exactly. You're like, order a regular burrito and then order just a fucking tortilla with sour cream in it. You're like, just charge them. I don't know what to charge them. Just here's, <laughs> here's the shit for free. Just don't come back to our store anymore. Yeah, you freak. Um, yeah. <laughs> don't blow but up our bathroom. That, it, exactly. It's like, well, <laughs> like you see the guy finish the two burritos and he goes into your bathroom. I'm like, God damn it. Do not give that guy the code. Do not give him the code for the bathroom. Um. But yeah, so like if you eat too much fat, like you would never do that, right? Because you would just blow chunks during squatting. Or if you're right. like a cyclist, you would blow chunks on your bike. And vomit is really difficult to clean out of like the gears of your bike. I'd imagine. Believe it or not. Yeah. For sure. So, you know, it's purely theoretical. I've never been on a bicycle in my entire life. <laughs> my quads are too fucking big, brothers. They can't even touch the fucking pedals. But but no, like, yeah, so so fat interferes with fat. And, and again, the, the same problem or similar problem is available on the backside of a workout or after a workout. 
you want carbohydrates to get into the bloodstream and amino acids relatively quickly. And if you eat a bunch of fat, that doesn't really happen. So fat in a nutrient timing generally behaves inversely to carbohydrates. Like when your carbs are high, pre-workout, post-workout, your fats are lower, lower. So people like people take the shit to the extreme and they're like, all right, so I was figuring out kids' cereals to eat post-workout, which is, by the way, a really good post-workout treat with some protein. And they're like, this one cereal is a gram of fucking fat. I want just zero fat because that gram's going to fuck me up. That gram isn't going to do shit. Just don't put gobs of peanut butter in your shit, and you'll be good to go. Yeah, easy. Perfect. Man, that was uh, everything we could have asked for in the question. Mike, this is your time. Plug away. Where can people find you? RP Dr. Mike on Instagram. I'm oh, sorry, at RP. If I didn't say the at, what the fuck would people type in, right? It'd be so exactly. lost. Like, yeah, like how does this work? So at RP Dr. Mike on Instagram, uh, it's my personal account. Renaissance Periodization is at RP Strength, and that's where you can find links to the RP Diet app. The thing after the app uh, we talked about recently was a joke. Uh, it doesn't actually make dogs smile at you or portraits of you appear. But I'm out. it does do all the other shit I said. That's not entirely a joke. So it is a real app. Please give it a shot free trial. Uh, so that's where you can find it. Awesome. I'm Silent Mike. YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, uh, what's the other one? Twitter, Instagram, <laughs> all those stupid things. <laughs> you said YouTube twice. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably on some other channel. Who knows? <laughs> I think we all were. Uh, anyway, I am at the Jim McD. Jim McD. I can't even talk. I am at the Jim McD on all the social medias. Follow the show on Instagram and Twitter. 50% facts where percent is a word. Leave us a rating review on iTunes. Tell all your friends. Share on social media the wealth of information that uh, Dr. Mike Ifshitel has provided for us in this episode. And we'll talk to you next time.